worship today. Our message is entitled, Stand Still, Stand Still, Hallelujah. Exodus chapter 14, verse number 10. Exodus chapter 14, verse number 10. Turn there with me if you're uh, watching at home, in your house, in your bedroom, in the kitchen, living, dining room. Maybe you're in a park. It's too cold maybe for that. But wherever you are, turn with me to the book of Exodus chapter 14. And we're going to begin reading at verse number 10. The word of God says to us today. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. Verse 11 says, And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Simply those two words that we share today in sermon title, stand still. Stand still. Before we talk with you, let's talk to the Lord. Lord God, bless us now. Uh, we have testified. We have been ministered to through recitation. We have heard melodious sounds of music from the praise and worship songs to the hymn to the spirituals by the aliens but now we need a word from you so disappoint us not lord again every week you do it i'm asking you to do it again speak through this your servant and hide me behind your cross and forgive us of our sins and when the appeal time comes you do what you do move by your power and sprinkle out your grace and may your people respond to your voice Forgive me of my sins, in Jesus' name, amen. Stand still. The Israelites had been enslaved by the Egyptians for 400 years. They had worked and suffered under the rule of the pharaohs. They had been oppressed, suppressed, and repressed for generations. But then God calls Moses, and he calls Moses to lead the emancipation of his people. God used Moses and 10 miraculous plagues to win the freedom of the Israelites and to demonstrate his glory. So now Israel starts their journey. They start their expedition. They start their voyage with confidence that they're on their way to the promised land. But the Bible says that instead of taking the most direct route, instead of taking the easiest route, instead of taking the shortest route, God leads the children of Israel through the longest route to the shore of the Red Sea. Now, someone may ask, why does God lead his children on the longest route? But I've learned sometimes that God's methods of deliverance may not be the way you want it to be delivered. Sometimes when God brings you out, he doesn't bring you out the easiest routes. There are some people who want deliverance in their life as long as it doesn't cost you something. But I'm here to let somebody know that God's blessings sometimes cost you something. And I've learned that sometimes God takes us the long way when he's trying to get us to go where he wants us to go. We ask the question, God, why did I have to start out as the administrative assistant, then be an assistant director, then be an associate director if I was going to end up being the director anyway? God, 
why do I have to be the team video coordinator, then the team scout, then the team assistant coach, if I were going to be the head coach anyway? God, why do I have to be the accounting intern only to end up being the accountant to later be the assistant treasurer if I were going to end up being the treasurer anyway? God, why did I have to start out at a two-member church? and then go to a 20-member church, then go to a 200-member church if I'm going to end up in a 2,000-member church anyway. But I've learned in my life that God never really uses anybody in a great way until he first prepares them for what's about to take place in their life. You see, Joseph, you can't rule and be governor of Egypt until you've been thrown in a pit by your brothers. Elijah, you can't stand on Mount Carmel in power until you sit at the brook of Cherith in humility. Paul, you can't be the greatest writer of the New Testament until you go blind on a Damascus road. And so Israel, you can't get to the promised land until you first go through the wilderness. You see, friends, if Israel had taken the direct route, the shortest route, it would have meant that the journey would have taken only two weeks. But the direct route would have also meant that the Israelites would have had to go past Egyptian strongholds. And then if the Egyptian Israelites had gotten by the Egyptians, then the Bible says they would have had to have faced the Philistines along the same route. But God knew what Israel could handle. And God knew what Israel couldn't handle. He knew that at the first sign of trouble, they would have gone running back to Egypt. You see, God knows our futures. I said, God knows our futures. He knows the beginning and he knows the end. Jeremiah 29, 11 is clear. God says, well, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. But you see, friends of mine, I've learned in my life that part of the problem, part of our problem we have is we think we have to be in control all of the time. We think we know better than an all-knowing God. But let me remind you, God's been longer than you've been you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We've got to let God lead. God is omnipotent. God is omnipresent. God is omniscient. He's God, and God knows what he's doing. Israel couldn't have gone the shortest route. Ellen White says to us in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 282, that the Israelites wouldn't have been prepared to fight the Philistines if they had gone the shortest route. Specifically, she says... They were unarmed, (laughs) unarmed and unaccustomed to war. And their spirits were depressed by long bondage. By leading them by the way of the Red Sea, the Lord revealed himself as a God of compassion as well as of judgment. So what happens? The Israelites start their journey. But back in Egypt, Pharaoh and his imps start asking themselves, have we done the right thing? Should we have let them go? And these questions, my friends, are fueled by the fact that when Israel left Egypt, the economy of Egypt was threatened. Let me throw this in right now. (laughs) Most fighting in a country and debates over freedom have to do with money. You don't believe me? Fighting in the Middle East, that's oil. That's money. The French Revolution, money. Democrats versus Republicans, money. Immigration reform, money. The coronavirus and whether we should lock down the country or open it up, money. Slavery in the United States, money. You see, don't be deceived. Let me put a kickstand right here. Don't be deceived. Slavery wasn't just practiced in the United States because there was a notion of white supremacy in the United States. Yes, that notion was here, and in in many cases, it's still here, but slavery was primarily practiced because of money. History says slavery was so profitable in the United States that it grew more millionaires per capita in the Mississippi River Valley than anywhere in the nation. With the cash crops of tobacco, cotton, and sugar cane, America's southern states became the economic engine of the nation in its early years. And its fuel of choice, slavery. And enslaved workers represented America's largest financial asset. So America didn't want 
to end slavery. Don't be deceived. The Emancipation Proclamation in 1865 did not free the slaves. The Emancipation Proclamation preserved the Union because how could slaves be free if they didn't own anything in the first place? They were free to do what? Let me tell you something, read your history. Know your history and stop believing all these books written by some of these people who want you to know history from their perspective, which is oftentimes not the truth. Let me tell you something, I'm not from France. I'm from the United States. So how am I going to be able to write a French history book and I need to be told French history just like the next man? I can only speak French history in the third person. He, she, it, them, they. Just like that, how is somebody who's not black going to be able to write first person black history? Just like me with the French, they can only speak in the third person. You can't tell me my story just like I can't tell you my story. Y'all ain't ready for me today. Pharaoh and the Egyptians started chasing the Israelites, not so much because Pharaoh wanted the slaves back, because if Pharaoh wanted more slaves, Pharaoh could have gotten more slaves. The problem was, that the slaves had taken their money. The Bible says that Israel had taken their flocks, their herds, and much cattle with them. But God had already told them this was gonna happen. He had already told Abraham in Genesis chapter 15 that after the Israelites came out of Egypt, they were gonna come out with great substance. So what does Pharaoh do? Pharaoh gets his best horses, his best chariots, and he says, you've messed up my money. You've messed up the Benjamins. You've messed up the economy of Egypt. I've got to get you back. Ellen White says that they start hearing reports that the Israelites are pressing forward to the Red Sea because see, Pharaoh originally, hallelujah, Pharaoh originally, thank you Holy Ghost for this thought, Pharaoh originally thought that after he had allowed the children of Israel to leave Egypt that they would need him and come running back. What does that mean? That reminds me of something in Adventist history since we're talking about black history. Because that's the same thing that the brethren thought would happen with the regional conferences in the 1940s. What did they say? Don't worry, they'll be back. They don't have enough money. They don't have enough land. They don't have enough resources to make it. They will be back, but in the name of Jesus. 80 years later, we haven't been back. Nearly 80 years later, we've got nine regional conferences, a university called Oakwood that sits on nearly 1,200 acres, a boarding academy called Pine Forge that's on the River Manitani, a television ministry called Breath of Life, a periodical called Message Magazine, cumulative membership of 323,000 people, cumulative annual tithe of $190 million, and a retirement plan with over 300 million dollars in our investment portfolio. We ain't going back. And the children of Israel weren't going back either. And so Pharaoh's counselors tell Pharaoh, we've got to get them because if we don't, they're not coming back. So Pharaoh gets his troops and he sets out to get the Israelites back. He leads the chase in his chariot with 600 chosen chariots behind him and the rest of the chariots of Egypt behind them. And they pursue the children of Israel. The Bible says in Exodus 14, 9, that Pharaoh and the Egyptians overtake the Israelites as the Israelites camp by the sea. The Israelites get scared. The Red Sea is in front of them. Pharaoh is behind them. Walls and mountains are beside them. From the way things looked, it looked like they were trapped. It looked like they were caught. To the natural eye, they were doomed. To the carnal man, they were dead with no detour. And so the Bible says they start murmuring and they start complaining and crying out to Moses, did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Were there no graves for us in Egypt? Didn't you tell us, didn't we tell you, leave us alone so we could serve the Egyptians, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than for us to die in the wilderness. But the Israelites' life in Egypt was nothing worth returning to. Pharaoh had oppressed them, raped their women, beaten their sons, 
why on God's green earth would they want to go back? They wanted to go back because Pharaoh had oppressed them not only physically but also mentally. God had gotten Israel out of Egypt, but now God had to get Egypt out of Israel. Because when you stay in bondage for so long, once you're delivered, you still think like an Egyptian, walk like an Egyptian, talk like an Egyptian, and act like an Egyptian. And just like the Israelites, many people have been saved from their sin, but they're still in bondage to their sin nature. I wish I had time. Moses is between a rock and a hard place. Because on one hand, he understands that he speaks to God on behalf of the people, but on the other hand, he understands that he speaks to the people on behalf of God. So then Moses is in the middle of a complaining people and a delivering God. But God (laughs) gives Moses the solution to this dilemma. He says, Moses, there's only one thing for you to do. He says, Moses, get up and go forward. You've come too far to turn back now. There's no going back now. I didn't bring you out to take you back. I didn't bring you out to camp here. This is not the land, I promise you. The only thing left for you to do is to go forward. Today, I must confess in my ministry that I've had the privilege of pastoring some modern-day Israelites who have said to me in my ministry, we've never done it that way before. We can't see it. It won't work. Are you sure this is the will of God? Are you sure we should move forward? How much will it cost? But the Lord told me to tell somebody today, we can't go back. There's nothing to go back to. I wish I had a church in this place. Even in ministry, while in this season of the coronavirus, we're not going back. Ministry will never be the same. Now, hopefully, we'll be able soon one day to be having in-person church. But I need you to know we're living in a new normal. We're living in a new digital environment. And if you go back, you'll be destroyed. If you go back, you'll return to slavery. If you go back, you'll be left behind trying to do eight-track ministry in a digital society, bound in ministry, suppressed in service. So the best thing for us to do is go forward. I know people all over the world talking about, I can't wait till we go back to normal. But what normalcy are you talking about? The normalcy of being sinful? The normalcy of being hateful? The normalcy of being liars? The normalcy of being backbiters? The normalcy of being deceivers? What normalcy are you talking about? Because I don't know about you, but I don't want or I need that type of normalcy in my life. Forget the past. Forget Egypt. It's time to bury the past and go forward. Speaking of going forward, let, let's, let's circle back to the church for a minute. Because before the church can go forward, the people must go forward. Because it's the people that make up the church. Are you hearing what I'm saying, everybody? And when you can't go to the left and you can't go to the right or you can't go backward, there's nothing to do but to go forward. I know that there are some who'd rather stay where they are. They'd rather camp out where they are and enjoy the view. Because some like it where they are. Some have become complacent and satisfied and comfortable where we are. Some like the status quo. Some like maintenance ministry. Some like irrelevant, isolated, insulated, incestual church. But the fruit of incest is always something retarded. And God is calling us out of our comfort zones. And he's calling us out of these places where we've been camped out at. And he wants us to go forward. I listen to a lot of people. They come up to me and they say, Pastor Bird, you're always doing something. You always have a project. You always have something going on. You're always busy. Why? Because I'm trying to move forward. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Let me tell you something. I have learned, and I've learned through this text. It became real for me this week. I have learned that it's important for me as the pastor. It's important for me as a leader to keep moving forward, to remain progressive, to not become stale, stagnant, or stuck in ministry, just going through the motions with no vision and no challenges. You see, I've learned that if you're the leader and you're not going forward, you're hindering somebody behind you from going forward. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Let me break this down. The Bible says in Exodus 12, 37, that there were about 600,000 men, Israelite men, on foot, plus women 
and children in the Israelite camp, which means there were several million people marching in the wilderness. Stay with me. But the people marching, these millions, the people in the 50th row couldn't go anywhere until the people in the first row moved. Which means, as the leader, the people standing behind you can't go forward unless you go forward. Your children can't go forward unless you, the parents, go forward. Employees can't go forward unless the employer goes forward. Basketball players can't go forward until the coach goes forward. The church can't go forward unless the leader goes forward. And a lot of people and organizations can't go forward because the ones on the front row aren't going forward. Somebody's still asking, why, Pastor Bird, do we need to go forward? Why is going so forward so important? I'll tell you why going forward is important. It's because if we stop going for, forward, eventually we'll start going backward. But not only that, I've learned, number one, when you don't go forward, you're going to stop walking by faith. And you're going to start living in fear. The minute you stop going forward or making progress in your spiritual walk, the next thing you know is you will find yourself no longer walking in faith but living in fear. When the children of Israel, think about it, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt on deliverance day and they were going forward into the promised land, there wasn't an ounce of fear in their hearts. They marched out of Egypt singing the songs of Zion. They were playing their tambourines. They were clapping their hands. They were even dancing in the name of Jesus. They were rejoicing in the Lord. They were on their way out of bondage in Egypt and on their way to freedom in the promised land. They were going forward. But the moment they stopped going forward, faith was replaced with fear. Trust was replaced with trepidation. And assurance was replaced with with suspicion. So instead of the army of faith singing the victory song, How I Got Over, the only verse of the song they could remember is, My soul looks back and wonders because they were filled with fear. But not only that, when you don't move forward, complaining starts. You brought us out of Egypt, Moses, to die in the wilderness. The Israelites started murmuring and complaining, but not only that. When you aren't going forward, you start backsliding. We should have stayed in Egypt and served the Egyptians. Take us back to Egypt. We would have been better off there. Let's go back. <laughs> but Moses says to the people, fear not in verse 13. In other words, don't panic. But just like the Israelites, Sometimes in our lives, danger seems to dominate. Isn't it funny how danger always screams louder than the deliverance? That the focus is more on the terror than the trust. That the depth of the faith in the care and power of God diminishes as the threat increases. What is the Pharaoh in your life that's pressing you? A rocky marriage, wayward children, Declining health, enormous debt, fear of the coronavirus, the threat of cancer, an underpaying job with an unappreciative boss. What is your pharaoh? And today, I don't know what your pharaoh is, but I'll tell you what the Lord told me to tell you. He told me to tell you fear not because fear is the opposite of faith. Now, we define faith according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 1, that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But this week I was reading and I was studying, and I like the definition of faith by the renowned pastor, Pastor Tony Evans. Pastor Evans defines faith like this. He says, faith is acting as if something is true when it doesn't appear to be true, in order that it might be shown to be true, simply because God said it's true. <laughs> That's faith. I like that definition. I'm gonna say it one more time. Tony Evans says, faith is acting as if something is true when it doesn't appear to be true, in order that it might be shown to be true, simply because God said it's true. 
Now, the Carlton Bird version is that please say, if God said it, that settles it. And he may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. You see, faith must affirm what it can't prove. And there are times when I have to affirm that God lives and God still loves me, even when I feel I can't prove it. What am I talking about? You see, I'm God's child, but then he comes, and 22 years ago nearly, he takes away my child. You love him, but then you lose your job. You praise him, but then your mother dies. You give him your life and you return your tithe and offering, but then your car is repossessed. You trust him and you read your Bible, but yet you get fired from your job. And then somebody has to walk up to you and say, how can you let God, hap- let God uh, how can God let this happen to you? And then your faith has to kick in and it has to affirm what you can't prove. Faith is not proven in abundance. Faith is not proven only when the sun is shining. Faith is proven in tough times, dark days. Faith is proven when the lights are off. Faith is proven when your bills are due and your money is low. God can't let you go through life without any tests because it won't build your faith. So God allows you to go through tests so it will bring credibility to your testimony. But in those tough times, you can't panic. Pharaoh may be behind you and Pharaoh may be advancing on you, but the Lord is on your side. And your Red Sea, I'm here to tell you, will part if you just cry out in faith. But fear not wasn't the only thing that Moses told the people in verse 13. Moses also told the people the title of our sermon. Moses said, look, stand still. I said, Moses said, stand still. I know the enemy is coming, but stand still. I know Pharaoh is advancing, but stand still. I know we're at a dead end and water is in front of us, but stand still. I know it looks like we're about to die, but I dare you to stand still today and see the salvation of the Lord. If I hold my peace and the Lord fights my battle, victory shall be mine. Stand still. The original Greek word, the original rather Hebrew word for being still is rapha. It means to stop striving, to cause yourself to let go of ang- anger and anxiety and frustration. Being still is to relax, knowing God is in control. So you see, there are things in our lives that are going to happen that we can't control. And when that happens, it's going to require us to stand still and know that he is God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, don't get it twisted because there are some people who think standing still means doing nothing. But standing still or waiting is not inactivity. Standing still or waiting is not sitting around doing nothing. Waiting is doing what you need to do, but you know God is coming. Stay, waiting is waiting and standing still, but knowing that God is on the way. This business of standing still and waiting has thrown a lot of people off because we think that waiting means you just sit there and don't go looking for a job when you're unemployed. But let me tell you what waiting and standing still means. It means you have to fill out an application. It means you've got to go on the internet. It means you've got to search and look because God is going to do what he's got to do, but you've got to do what you need to do. Somebody's not getting this. Let me help you. Go with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 12, one of my favorite biblical stories. The Bible says that Peter is in prison, but the Bible says that the church is back praying without ceasing, praying for his release. And the angel showed up while the people were praying. And Peter was so sure that God was about to do what God is about was about to do that the Bible says Peter fell asleep. The Bible says he fell so much asleep that it was hard to wake him up. So the angel had to come in and wake him up. And when the angel told him, came in and woke him up, the angel told Peter, get up, put your clothes on and follow me. When they got to where the guards were, the angel took care of that. When they got to the iron gates, Peter didn't know how the iron gate was going to open, so the angel took care of that too. 
But the Bible says that when Peter got to where he could recognize where he was, the angel vanished out of his sight because God is going to take care of what you can't take care of. But when you get to where you can take care of it, then you've got to do what you can do. Leave to God what you can't do, but do what you can do. If you need to lose weight, quit eating ice cream late at night. Yes, ask God for help, but don't ask God to cancel the calories. If you need a job, then hit every place in town with a now hiring or help wanted sign. A low paying job is better than a no paying job. If you have a besetting sin, avoid places and avoid people that stimulate that sin. Do what's in your power and then let God exercise his power. I feel my help coming on. The Israelites did what was in their power to do and Pharaoh still closed in on them. What did they do? They cried out to the Lord. They didn't try to swim across the sea. They didn't try to build a boat or build a bridge. But they stood still where they were. They didn't do a thing in their deliverance. They stood still. And you know why they didn't do a thing? Because they couldn't do a thing. And when you can't do a thing, get ready for God to do his thing. Moses said, stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. He's going to show it to you today. For the Egyptians you have seen today, you're going to see them no more. The Lord shall fight for you. If you just hold your peace, Moses then turns after he talks to the children of Israel. And the Bible says he cries out to the Lord. And then the Lord says, Brother Moses, why are you crying out to me? You just need to use what's in your hand. You've got to use what's in your hand because you've got what you need for your deliverance. I came to tell somebody today, when you need to be delivered, just use what's in your hand. God has given you everything you need. Just use what's in your hand. Moses stretches out his hand. He stretches it out over the Red Sea. And as Moses stretches forth his hands, the Bible says that God sends a wind, not a bridge, not a boat, not a ferry, not an airplane, not an angel, not a soldier, not a guard, but God sends a wind. That's why I get happy when I think of the goodness of Jesus. That's why I don't take the anointing of God lightly because whenever God sends a wind, I wish I had a church in his place. I said, whenever God sends a wind, great things happen and something is about to happen in somebody's life. I haven't seen it yet, but I hear the wind. I haven't seen it move yet, but I hear the wind. You haven't gotten your healing yet, but I hear the wind. The check hasn't come yet, but I hear the wind. Somebody needs to say, my son isn't saved yet. My daughter isn't saved yet. But I hear the wind. Something is about to happen. God blew back the Red Sea. God blew back the waters. And then he blew it so long that it became a hair dryer and dried the ground so that the children of Israel could walk across on dry land without getting mud on their shoes. But here comes Pharaoh. He's gaining on them. He's got to gain because he's running and they're walking. Have you ever felt like trouble was gaining on you? It wasn't like you weren't making progress, but you're not moving, moving fast enough for the level of trouble that's coming against you. But don't worry about that because I've learned in my Christian experience that sometimes God allows the enemy to gain on you. But God is just using you for bait because it's nothing but a setup. Thank you, Holy Ghost. A setup to lure the enemy into a position of destruction so you won't have to spend your next 400 years worrying about your past 400 years. I wish I had a witness in this place. And when Pharaoh starts coming through the way that God had only made for his people, all of a sudden, the wheels on their chariots start falling off. 
But remember now, the Bible told us that these were his best chariots. They were chosen chariots. So that means there shouldn't have been any trouble with any of these chariots. But that's what your enemies don't understand. They don't understand and they don't know that when they start messing with you, when they start messing with God's children, God will make things break down that should have been working right. Your enemies are cursed with a curse. God says, I will bless those that bless you. I will curse those that curse you. And no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. All of a sudden, Pharaoh says, what's wrong, bro? His imps. The chariot's not working. What do you mean it's not working? He says, the wheels aren't working. What do you mean the wheels aren't working? The wheels are coming off, Pharaoh. And that's what your enemy will go through when they try to kill you, when they try to impugn you, when they try to character assassinate you, right in the middle of their attack, when they come for the kill, things are going to start breaking down in their life because God's going to break off their wheels to get you out. I wish I had a witness in this place. So when the Israelites cross over the Red Sea and Pharaoh's trying to catch them, but their stuff is falling apart. They're getting confused and they're starting to become disheartened in their pursuit. Why? They've invested all this time, all this energy, all this money in forming weapons to bring you down, but their wheels keep falling off. So when the Israelites got out, God says, Moses, hold up, we're not through yet. Don't just walk out. The same hand <laughs> that you raise to open up the way, raise it again to shut it down. And God is trying to tell somebody else the same thing today. As soon as you come through and go through what you're going through, God's going to shut it down. All you've got to do is give God the sign. And when you give God the sign, the walls that you were worried about falling on you are the very walls that are going to fall on them. I'm trying to take my seat, but I need to warn somebody. That's why you need to be careful who you talk about. That's why you need to be careful who you dog out. That's why you better be careful who you criticize. Be sure your sins will find you out. Because whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. So here come the Israelites out of the Red Sea. And Moses turns around. <laughs> And he stretches forth that same hand. And when he stretches his hand forward, everything that formerly opened up shuts down. Because the same God who opens doors is the same God who can shut some doors. Don't worry about the people who are trying to mess with you. Don't worry about the people who are trying to criticize you and step in your blessing. Don't worry about the people who are trying to get in your position because the same God who opened doors is the same God who will shut doors. When they get across the Red Sea, I'm trying to stop, but all of a sudden, the waters come down. And the waters that they are worried about coming down on them come down on the enemy. And all of a sudden, <laughs> Pharaoh, and his imps, his army, drowned in the Red Sea. Miriam grabs a tambourine and she starts beating that thing. And Miriam starts praising God. She praises him for what he's done. She praises him for what he's doing. She praises him for what he's getting ready to do. He, she's praising him for all the things he kept off her. And somebody today needs to praise God for all the things God kept off you, for all the things that God didn't let happen to you. I almost didn't make it, but God. I had coronavirus, but God. I was diagnosed with cancer, but God. I almost lost my mind, but God. I almost gave up, but God. 
And when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, thank God for saving me. So bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Stand still, stand still, stand still, and today see the salvation of the Lord. Today, what is your Pharaoh? Don't act all prim and proper because everyone has a Pharaoh. Today, what is your Pharaoh? What is the Pharaoh that is advancing on you today? What is the Pharaoh? Who is the Pharaoh that seems to be overtaking you? I dare you to fear not. God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love, a sound mind, a power. I dare you to fear not. God said, fear now not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, I will help thee, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. God says, fear not, but God only so says today, stand still. 